Welcome back, and in this presentation, we're going to talk about blood collection in special populations. All right, the pediatric patient. Let's explain how blood collection supplies and venipuncture procedures are modified for pediatric patients. Now, dealing with parents and guardians, we need to be warm and friendly. Have a calm voice, talk in a normal tone, do not come in there overly uh, excited or loud, which can actually scare the child or make the parents nervous. We want to be calm and confident. The key thing is being confident when you're dealing with children and of course being very calm around them. Now identify past experiences. We want to be able to provide insight to what we're doing to the parent and if the child's old enough, kind of maybe get a doll and demonstrate to what you're about to do, whether it's a vena puncture or a capillary skin puncture. And also involvement of the parent is encouraged. Okay, we want to reduce child's anxiety. It's okay for the parent to hold the child, maybe help with restraining them if needed, but everything else applies the same. We ID the patient with the parent. We approach them the same way. We're confident, we're warm, friendly, give them insight to what we're doing, explain to them. Again, even using a doll if we have one, uh, having them get involved and holding the child is okay. These are things that need to be understood when dealing with the pediatric patient. These are sensitive issues when dealing with children because parents want to make sure you know what you're doing and that you are up for the task in sticking their child and not having to do it more than once. Now one of the first things you want to do is physically lower yourself to the child. Why? This is less intimidating to the child. It puts you at their level and that you're, you're not looking down on the child in an intimidating way. So lower yourself down to the child's level at an eye to eye level, which again becomes less intimidating to the child. You want to be able to explain in easy terms and be honest. Again, do not tell the child that this is not going to hurt because in reality, it is going to hurt and it's going to be a little bit of discomfort for them when that needle goes in the arm. So again, don't lie and tell him it will not hurt. You can tell the child if he's old enough that he's going to feel a slight stick or pinch. But again, be honest and use easy and clear terms. Now, maybe ne it may be necessary to restrain the child and we must hold the arm steady. So if the parent wants to help and restrain the child, we've got to make sure that the arm is in the proper position and that it's steady and will not move. So sometimes it might have to both the father and the mother help hold the child or bring in another phlebotomist or worker to come in and help restrain the child. Now the modification of equipment. We must make sure that we're not removing more than 10% of the infant's blood volume at one time. This can lead to shock and cardiac arrest. So we will not be using the larger adult tubes or even the smaller tubes, the four to six mil. We're going to be looking for the 1.8 mil. These are more of the micro pediatric tubes as you see in the picture below. And these are used to collect the blood. Now sometimes we can use a capillary stick which is the same as a venipuncture in the sense that we can collect it in an additive tube and invert and take it back to the lab. But we must make sure that we're using the proper size needle which is in this case could be a 23 gauge and the proper size tube for blood collection whether it be venipuncture or a capillary skin puncture. Now let's talk about the geriatric patients and explain the physical conditions that may occur with geriatric patients that should be considered when collecting blood, such as hearing loss. In this case, geriatric patients that have a, have a hearing loss issue, we must speak louder, slower, and more clear to the patient. We might even have to get closer to the patient so they can hear us and speak in the direction that they have a good ear on. Therefore, don't speak too loud where we might be in violation of HIPAA as well. Now, with failing eyesight, in this case, we might have to be escorting the patient around the lab, in and out of the waiting room, to the restroom, to the chair, because in low lighted areas, which we should not have in a, our lab facility, they can trip and fall. Therefore, an escort or a guardian that's with them will have to bring them back around the lab. That way, we don't have any issues with them tripping and falling over things. Also, memory loss. A lot of geriatric patients have a hard time remembering things, remembering things. Therefore, they might not remember if they're fasting or what medication they're on. They might not even remember their last name. Therefore, if they're with a guardian, we should ask them and confirm and validate the information we're trying to obtain from the patient. As well as we might have to repeat ourselves if the geriatric patient is alone. We have to repeat and verify more than one time. Changes in skin condition. 
a geriatric patient's skin will get a lot more fragile and more thinner. Therefore, we should be using a 23 gauge butterfly needle with geriatric patients. This would minimize the risk of bruising and a collapsed vein. Also, we should not be using the larger tubes, the four to six mil adult tubes, because the vacuum is too strong for a 23 gauge needle, specifically with geriatric patients. So a 23 gauge butterfly needle, as well as pediatric tubes should be used. Muscles become smaller with geriatric patients. Again, they become weaker. Therefore, the proper angle of insertion is key as well as the angle we go into the vein. Therefore, again, a 23 gauge butterfly needle with pediatric tubes gives us easier access to the vein and at the proper angle. Decreased blood circulation. We got to consider this. This is why we will be using pediatric tubes because the larger adult tubes will be harder to fill when a patient specifically a geriatric patient has decreased blood circulation. Therefore, we can fill the pediatric tubes easier with a 23 gauge butterfly needle so that it will not get rejected from the lab. Now, with increased sensitivities and allergies, this happens because the immune system gets weaker as we get older. Therefore, we must be careful on the types of tourniquets we're using and the types of gloves we are using on the patient. We do not want them to have a reaction to the gloves or the tourniquets while they are in our presence and in our chair. Now let's talk about the resistant patient. There are a number of things that we must do for a resistant patient. The one thing is give reassurance. We need to reassure them that we know what we're doing, that the explain the procedure to them and the way that they can understand, give them a calm voice explain or answer any questions that they might have that we are able to and that we are allowed to. We just want to make sure that the patient is calm and reassured that we are there to take their blood in the most painless way possible. We never want to tell a patient, like we said before, that it will not hurt. Saying you will feel a slight pinch or a slight stick is okay. Now again, we must give this to the patient reassurance because a lot of patients will have anxiety being in the room or have an anxiety around needles in which we need to be able to reassure them and help them overcome this. Also avoid any unnecessary or excessive needle procedures. Now this is where it becomes critical. We need to have a phlebotomist in these types of situations that has a lot of experience where we know one stick is all that might be needed. If we have a phlebotomist that does not have the experience and has a harder time with patients, we want to avoid them with the resistant patient because they that's a higher risk of having to stick them more than once. So in this type of patient, we need to get the most experienced phlebotomist. That way they can give the reassurance and also avoid any additional sticks that might not be needed. Topical anesthetics. Now, not, not every lab or hospital uses topical anesthetics that might help numb the surface of the skin. So depending on where you work and the facility that you're at, you can inquire about usage of topical anesthetics that might help numb the area like lidocaine patches and so forth or lidocaine creams and ointments. That is up to every individual facility. Not every facility will use those types of topical anesthetics. Also, the patient has the right to refuse treatment. If at any point during the procedure they decline to have their blood drawn, then they have every right to do so. And in return, you as the phlebotomist, if you don't feel comfortable with the resistant patient or you don't feel confident, you have the right to refuse to draw the blood and get another phlebotomist who might have more experience than you to come and draw their blood. But it works both ways. They have the right to refuse the treatment and we have the right to refuse to draw their blood if we have an issue with drawing the blood or we feel that we might have an issue. The psychiatric patient. Now in this case, with the psychiatric patients, we need to be informed before we go and draw their blood. Typically, we need to understand what type of patient are we dealing with. Are we dealing with a very violent patient, someone who can get violent with us, or someone who might be sedated or under some type of medication? We need to be informed before we enter a room of a psychiatric patient. We need to, have, we need to gain cooperation not just with the patient themselves, but also with the people who might be bringing them in or escorting them or their guardians from the psychiatric ward. Again, gaining cooperation of both the patient and the workers is key to obtaining a successful blood sample. We need to place equipment away from the patient. Do not put 
equipment next to the patient at arm's reach where they can grab a needle or grab something from there and injure themselves or injure you, the phlebotomist. So keep things away from the patient before the blood draw. Also, restraints may be necessary. Again, if we're informed that this is a violent patient or could be violent, even if they're medicated, we need to have restraints on the patient to keep them from moving or, or spitting or punching or hitting or grabbing something from our hand while we're drawing the blood. Restraints may be needed as necessary. Also, we need to allow for extra time. With psychiatric patients, it might take longer than your average time. So we might be down there for 15 or 20 minutes with a psychiatric patient, depending on what type of patient we're dealing with. So again, allow for extra time. The obese patient. These are deep and difficult veins to find and palpate, even with a tourniquet. And we'll be talking about the type of tourniquet we might have to use or alter. But again, deep and difficult veins. We must consider that at the antecubital fossa, it's at the bend of the elbow, it's going to be harder to find, palpate, and locate veins. Therefore, hand veins on the back of the hand and on the wrist might be a better way to locate a vein. So again, hand and wrist are more ideal for an obese patient. Now, ask about previous successful sites. It's okay to ask the patient where they were drawn before, where they got blood before. The patient might have a better uh, site that you might be able to obtain the blood that the last phlebotomist got blood from. We just got to be careful that there isn't any kind of bruising or sclerosis or anything that will prohibit you from getting the blood. So again, ask about previous successful sites from the patient. And then of course, equipment modification. We got to consider a blood pressure cuff instead of a tourniquet. If depending on the size of the patient, how big they are, we might have to use a blood pressure cuff around the site and then pump it up to get venous restrictions so that we can locate a vein. This is an option. Or even a pin rose drain tube, which is like a really long tourniquet, but more of a rubber tubing that we can wrap around and put real tight on the patient to help locate a veins. These are some of the options with the obese patient. So take these in consideration because this you will encounter these types of patients in your hospital or lab facility. Patients with phlebosclerosis. In the other video with geriatric patients, we touched on phlebosclerosis. That is the hardening of the vein. Phlebo vein sclerosis hardening or cord-like feeling of the vein. Now again, these are hard and cord-like veins. They lack resiliency or buoyancy. They're not spongy like a vein should be. They're more ropey and hard. Now we should choose another site if possible. We need to try to avoid a phlebosclerosis site. So again, look at the back of the hands, the wrist, the other arm. Try to find another site that we can access the vein and get the blood. Now, tur uh, now with tourniquets, we could put them at the back of the wrist just above the site, three to four inches, and using butterfly needles with patients that might have phlebosclerosis is what we need to be using. And this is if we have to draw below the damaged vein. So if we have no other sites to go for, we would apply the tourniquet appropriately and draw below the damaged vein, preferably with a butterfly needle. 23 gauge is a, is a standard size needle that we should be using with patients with possible phlebosclerosis and again below the damaged vein. And finally, patients with skin damage. Avoid burn, scarred, and tattooed areas. Veins are difficult to penetrate. Now again, we see a patient that has either burned or scarred on the site, then we should avoid them even in the areas of, if they have tattoos. Healed burn site and extensive scarring may have impaired circulation or prone to infection. So again, we avoid the even the healed burn sites that have extensive and even with extensive scarring because again, they could impair circulation and they are at a higher risk for, for infection. Why tattoos? Because tattoos contain dyes which may interfere with test results. So we should not be drawing over a tattooed site. Again, the ink can come into the tube and interfere with test results. If we have to draw a patient with a tattoo, if they're carved from head to toe, then we should make note of it and let the lab know that this patient was drawn over a tattooed site. Therefore, they can be aware of any uh, inerrant test results that may occur with that blood sample. This is the end of this video presentation of blood collection in special populations.